So I think we'll start now. So good evening to all of you. I think this is the uh, session number 101. So as usual, I will start with the short case first. Is my screen visible? And yes, is, is my screen visible? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, thank you. So you'll share the short case. This 44-year-old man came with history that he could not elevate his eyelids after closing for the last three years. In fact, he is a goldsmith by profession. And he says that after working with eyes in the downward position for a for for some time, he is unable to elevate his eyelids when you want to look up. His eyes remain closed. That is his main problem. He are working in the, you know, the gold, gold mills, what they do is that keep on bending the head and eyes, looking at the small things below. So this is the video of the patient. Ask him to close the eye. He open it. No other findings in this patient. So, what do you think the patient is having? Anyone would like? Pardon? Eyelid apraxia. Eyelid, apraxia of eyelid opening. Okay, very good. Any other possibility you want to keep in mind? Blepharospasm, sir. Yeah, blepharospasm confined to the palpable part. Okay, how to prove that point now? What will you do? Apraxia of eyelid opening or blepharospasm. Confirmed that papal part of the orbicular is okay. Look at the lower eyelid. Okay, lower eyelid is not actually looked for, but not very classically, it's not elevating, going up. So, this is what I did. Torka. Torka. Right to open. Torne. Okay. Sit here. The needle is in the low right? I am going to go with eyes open. Even with eyes open, it's from this eye coming. But I, I asked the patient to... Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you see it? Can you even if it's open, it is open. It's 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 open. Overaction of the lower knee. Murkia, the chain, Murkia, the key, Murkia, the key, very tight. I see, even with eyes open, it continues to have discharge. So that proves the point that patient was a temporal spasm in this patient. So many times, approximated opening to be difficult to differentiate whether it's a bifurcal spasm confined to the palpable part. This can easily solved by putting a needle in the lower eyelid. Because apraxia of eyelid opening, there is no reason why the lower eyelid should contract when the patient is trying to open the eyelid. Okay. Any questions? I will go for the next case. Sir, eyelid myotonia, how they will present, sir? Myotonia. Eyelid myotonia. myotonia is that the patient is. And uh, after it's same, exactly almost the same thing. After closing it, the patient will not be able to open the remain contracted for a period of time. 
Now, there the desire is a little different. There you can have the classical myotonic desires. Yes, sir. Yeah. Waxing and waning type of pattern we get. Here we can put that that uh, that one also as differential diagnosis, sir. Yeah, that also can be told as a differential diagnosis. Yes. When the patient gets on, and, but always it should be on after after closing, the patient will not be able to open that. It will remain contracted for some period of time. Yeah, that should be under the yeah. Okay, this is a story of a 30-year-old lady. This patient had been having diplopia with horizontal separation images for the last six months. The diplopia occurs after reading or straining her eyes for some time. It gets better after taking rest, that is after stopping reading for a few minutes. Story <clears throat> diplopia on long reading. That is a story. You look at the eye now very carefully. This patient. Okay. This is the primary position. One asked the patient look to the left side, right, up and forward, straight up, up and to the left, down and to the left, down. And down and to the right. And this is the looking straight ahead. Well, it's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. So, what do you think the patient is having? If you want to see the video, I can show once again. Do we do we retraction? But there is no retraction here. And usually, do we retraction? They do not come. They can come in diplopia, but uh, it's a long duration. Yeah, there is no attraction, no, no narrowing of the palpable vision. And there is no restriction of abduction per se. Was an abduction lag? No abduction lag. There is no abduction lag. Dr. Kair was here, sir. Uh, I think it might be a latent squint. Yeah, perfect. So let's we see that. No, he has got a... Uh, let us sort out this problem one by one. So this patient has been uh, seen by uh, people. I will show that later on. So it looks like she has got a, it's got a squint. You know? His left eye is adducted compared to the right side. Okay, That means she has got a failure of abduction on the left side. That is where left eye has gone up. Or it can be right lateral rectus as well. If you look at the eye now. If I, I can say that suppose patient is viewing with the left eye, it is the right atrectus weakness. If it's viewing in the right eye, as you imagine, maybe we she has got a left atrectus weakness. So either is possible with this position. Okay. So this patient was investigated earlier, and I say antibody was borderline positive. Ice pack test was said to be positive by the patient, and she felt better. And she was put on periodose segment steroid with partial improvement. And she had come because she was still troubled by her diplopia. Now, of course, what do you want to do now? Reduction. Okay, very good. Before that, my question is, is it left atelectus weakness? See, it looks like left atelectus weakness, correct? Or is it a right atelectus weakness? We are not sure. No, it appears like left left eye is moving because the left eye is more adducted, but we do, we do not know which eye is affected, or the culprit eye or lazy eye. So, what test will you do to differentiate whether the right eye is at fault or the left eye is at fault? Cover uncovered. Very good. Cover uncovered test. Why did the cover uncovered test? She is looking at you. In the mook in the tumbo, where every day can the matter. Very pomodlo. I covered the right eye in the tumbo. The left eye takes a different deviation. It looks straight. Mook in the tumbo. At a very good in the It goes back again. In the tumbo. Very good in the Okay. The left eye is a squinting eye. Let's start to try with the other eye. Mook in the tumbo. Very good in the I covered the eye. Nothing happened to the right eye. Now we know that. The lazy eye or the affected eye is on the left side. The right eye is the dominant eye which is missing in the object. So the squinting eye is on the left side. Next question is, that's left eye squinting eye. 
Next question is, is it due to paralysis or due to a concomitant skin that's not a bit was telling, which was telling? What will you do now? It may be a skin present from earlier, which became manifest later on, or maybe <laughs> development of an early mild lateral rectus weakness on the left side. How will you prove your point now? Alternate cover. Uh, can, no, can alternate cover will not help. But one thing will help. Well, that will help in another way. But the first thing you have to do is to do induction testing. You close one eye and look for the range of movement of each eye. The abduction is full in this patient. It is going beyond the margin itself. That means it's unlikely to be a paralytic state because the range of movement is full, full of protection on the left side. Then you try it on the right side, right down, so it's full of protection. Okay, that means it's unlikely to be due to paralysis. If it has rate paralysis, even in touch movement, it should have been short mild restriction. Then you try it on the right side, right down, so it's full of protection. Then you try it on the right side, right down, so it's full of protection. But as told before, sometimes mild restriction, mild paralysis, you may miss induction movement because the mild participation may be putting extra effort to move the eyelid so that it may appear apparently the reduction may, may appear normal. Because sometimes mild paralysis can be missed by induction testing. So, what would be the next thing to do now to differentiate between paralytic squint and a concomitant squint is looking for primary and secondary deviation. Now, what is primary deviation is the primary deviation is the deviation which is of the deviation pre present in the affected eye or a squinting eye. But a secondary deviation is the deviation of the normal eye or unaffected eye when the so-called so-called the lazy eye or affected eye is supposed to fix it. That will explain later. Look at this picture now. So here to find out you do the alternate cover test. Alternate cover test. So look for range of movement of the redress of the normal eye and the squinting eye. I will show the video, then you will understand this thing. In paralytic squint, the movement of redress is more in the normal eye when that eye is uncovered compared to the affected eye. In concomitant squint, the movement of the redress is equal in the normal eye and the unaffected eye. Let us this patient's cover uncovered test. Usually, this cover and cover test, sorry, alternate cover test is used to differentiate heterophoria from heterotropia. That is a latent squint from a manifest squint. Latent squint means obviously there is no squint in the primary position. Or, or the patient looks in the primary position, but it been a, the squint becomes manifest when the patient closes one eye, but the binocular vision is blocked. To, do, to find out that thing, you do the alternate cover test. Here, the idea of doing cover test is to find out whether the primary and secondary deviation is different, same or different. So, I am covering the eye on the right side. This is a deviation of the eye, eye taking place in the neither eye. I covered the right and look at the deviation of the left eye. And the deviation of the normal eye when the abnormal eye is covered. Okay, it is almost the same, or the movement of the normal eye is less compared to that of the paralytic eye. That means it is not a paralytic skin. Now, if you are a little confused, I will explain it a little more in detail. So, when you normally, when suppose imagine that I got a right lateral rectus weakness, but mild paralysis. In that case, suppose I close my right left eye. And I'm going to look at my right with the right eye looking at an object. I have to put an extra effort on my lateral rectus to look at the object because that eye is paralyzed. So, according to the Herring's law of vehicle innovation, the same amount of innovation should go to the contralateral agonist, yoke muscle, that is the left medial rectus. So, what will happen when I, when I ask to look with my paralyzed eye, the, the, when the, the, the left normal eye is undercovered. It's covered now. It's under cover now because it is not moving. So extra innovation also goes to the left medial rectus. So it will be moving much more than 
what the right arthritis is doing. So when you remove the cover, this normally takes a fixation. You find the larger movement of the normally. So that tells you that there is a palliative squinting. Here what is happening is the squinting eye is the left eye as you all know. So I covered the left eye, you find the right. And if you covered, sorry, when you have covered the right eye, normal eye, and patient is forced to look with the affected eye, that is the squinting eye of the left eye, the patient has to put extra effort of the right eye to bring to the, uh, the corresponding will be moving more. For example, if left eye is put, uh, focusing on that, there will be extra movement of the middle rex, the adequate position. So when you remove the cover, you put the extra movement will be seen as a larger movement. The, the recovery of the movement is called the redress. That is when you cover one eye, the deviation of the other eye is called the red, movement of redress. So I will show once again now. I'm covering that is a movement. I'll stop that. See, that's a movement taking place of the paralytic eye. See, do you, you already see that? Or the squinting eye. When the when the when the patient is uh, covering when we are covering the normal eye. Now, when I shift the cover to the other side, this is the movement which you are looking at. The normal eye, if it had been paralytic should have been moved much more. So when you put the cover, it should come much more laterally. That should have been much more than the left eye. So I think I'll explain it. So what are the test will be? The ice pack test to be fully certain it is uh, uh, not myasthenia because we are being treated, treated as myasthenia. So ice see. pack test is negative, this is after ice pack test. No, it is different. So we have to see. Even I did the neostigmine test. Is this before neostigmine? Okay. Here. That is after neostigmine. Okay. Again, same thing. No change. Okay. So this is as Dr. Bichu was telling this manifest latent skin or a latent esophoria, which had been there earlier, become, become a trophy or manifest skin later on, when the patient, um, some people develop later on, become manifest because of the fatigability, or even otherwise when the fusional system birth, uh, breaks down on prolonged viewing with eyes, or watching TV or mobile phone for a long period of time, this can happen. And I just drawn this diagram to make you understand that what is primary deviation, secondary deviation. Primary deviation, the deviation, the lazy or paretic eye, when the good eye or the non paretic eye fixes on the object. Secondary deviation, the deviation of the good or the non paretic eye, when the lazy or paretic eye fixes on the object. Secondary deviation is always greater than the primary deviation in paralytic strabismus because of the herring slow of vehicle innovation. Let us see this particular example here. This is the left eye. This is, now you have to be, this is the left eye on the left side here. Hmm? Right eye is here. The left eye is the good eye that is fixing onto the object. And there is inward deviation of the right paralytic eye because it's paralyzed. Lateral rectus is paralyzed, it's moved medially. Now what I do is that's the primary deviation, okay? That's the primary deviation. That is the deviation of the paralytic eye. Now, what I did was I covered my eye on the left side. Okay. That is the norm. The eye is fixing that eye, the eye which has been fixing for the good eye are covered. So, what happened now? The so called affected eye or the right eye has to take up the fixation. So, it put extra effort and put an abduction to bring the, bring the, onto the, bring the eye onto the target. So what will happen when this extra effort is now going to the contralateral or left medial rectus. So this globe will move much more than what was happening in the right eye. So this is the secondary deviation. That is much, if you look at the angle of deviation primary, this is secondary, this is more. Okay. So what I did here was that when I removed the cover, cover I want I looked at the, 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 the deviation going backward. It's called a movement of redress. From this deviated position, the movement which is going back to take up the fixation is noted. They can see it. The eyes come back. That is a normal eye. Here you find her right eye was the normal eye. That movement was little or minimal. 
If it had been paralytic, it would have been much more. If the left eye had been paralytic, the movement of the right eye should have been much more. Or a secondary deviation should have been more than the primary deviation. Now, is it clear to you now? Any doubts? This simple bedside touch can differentiate whether it's a lateral tectus weakness or not, or a concomitant skin, by which you can easily send off the patient for further management, rather than submitting to very, very, various steps of investigations. It's clear, sir. Okay, thank you, thank you. What is a, what, what can we do surgical correction? Yeah, the two things, if there's a deviation, it's only mild. Suppose here the deviation appears a little more than... Uh, Sometimes it may be very mild. In that case, we can do a prism glass by which we can align the eye uh, state for uh, deviate the eye to the primary bulb so that the image will be in, uh, in, will be parallel. The, the, the rays will be made parallel. So the patient will not feel diplopia. Okay. So what happens? You suppose the right eye, left eye is squinting. You put a prism glass so that the rays are deflected and to fall out the macula. So the patient will not. CA doubled, even the eyes are deviated a little bit inside. So you put a prism glass on the left side so that the rays are deflected so that the, the rays will fall on the macula and there's no diplopia. That is one way of tackling the situation. But if the deviation is more than what can be achieved, what can be corrected by the prism glass, the patient has to undergo a skin surgery. So I referred to the optometrist for, a, and, uh, for a prism glass if not for skin surgery. Unfortunately, many of these people go to the ophthalmologist, they look at the fundus and things like that, prescribe that nothing is wrong with you and send the uh, send neurologist. But it is the optometrist who have to deal with this problem. Okay. Shall I go to the next case? Yes. Yeah. This is a 40-year-old man who was admitted. Today, I got two, three short cases, no long cases. Next week, I got a really long case. Man was admitted with history of acute onset of inability to speak and weakness of right side of the body. So, this is the video of the patient. I am asking you to put his name. Sinuasa. No, no. Naka <laughs> Put out the tongue. Putting it again. That's good. It's got zero for the right of the Left olive, he could move normally. Right olive, he could move. Not as much as that, but it's really good power. The predominant effect was the right of So, it was mute or globally facing. Right and same play predominantly affecting the, sorry, not right and only monoplegia. Mildly weakness only of the right lower ear. So, what do you think about this patient? What is the patient? What is the localization? What is likely diagnosed? Sir, ACA territory, sir. Why ACA territory? Why not MCA territory? Sir, uh, facial uh, monoplegia is there, sir. Along with yeah. that, he was mute. Facial brachial monoplegia is classically seen in MCA territory, no? Why should, he... why should upper limb involvement occur in ACA territory? MCA cortical involved, sir. Hubner's yeah. artery can be. Yeah, it is. If it's a global FAC, again, more favoring MCA territory, no? 
What made you think it would be ACA? Uh, sir, the mute, he is mute, sir. Okay. Then how to spin the right upper limb weakness is bearing on the right lower limb? Anyway, what I said is exactly correct. But I want to know how would you explain that thing? What you observe it is correct. Broadband symptom. Cubeness artery, sir. Yeah, this is a cubeness artery, correct. So what do you want now? This is a CT scan. MRI. Yeah, an MRI could not be done because patient would not put. No, this is the CT scan. It shows the infarct here, the ACA tetany. Not infarct the MCA tetany. Now, how do you explain the facial brachial monopoly the ACA tetany infarct? It is due to the affection of humanus artery as far as was telling. Now, what is the clue to suspect ACA, which that doctor correctly said? What he was having is not a face here. He was an extreme aburian mutism. See, if you look at the patient's face again, he's not looking at you. He's behaving as if he's not bothered. Whatever I'm asking, he's not bothered. See, we, we just show the initial picture. He's yeah. looking yeah. somewhere yeah. else, not yeah. even looking and making eye yeah. contact with you. So that's the point. That's not an aphasia, it's a mute stage. So that is the point to suggest that he's got an AC infarct. If you look carefully, even the CT, you can see the infarct in the region of caudate nucleus, the anterior internal capsule. That area, the person is what responsible for the upper limb involvement. So, humanus artery usually arises as a single vessel, and as suggested by the name, it courses backward along the A1 segment. It penetrates the brain at the level of lateral anterior perforating substance, medial ciliary fissure, or orbital frontal lobe, and has up to 12 branches. It supplies the head of the caudate nucleus, anterior inferior part of the internal capsule, anterior globus pallidus, and putamen and the antihypothalamus and the nucleus accumulates. So this is a humanus artery, which you can see here, the one which is as the ACA rotating. See, it supplies the middle part of the cordate, middle part of the globus pallidus. And this is a nucleus accumulates where the, where, the, where the cordate and the globus pallidus join together. And that region affection produces the mutism and ebulia. Moreover, in ACA artery by itself can produce due to the singlet carous involvement, that is by the cortical branches, not by the humula. So these are the areas separate by the artery of humula, which I'll skip. So the classical presentation of ACA, uh, um, motor deficits are having the most common manifestation. Cortical branch occlusion usually the cells in motor deficits of the foot and the leg, and to a lesser degree, paresis of the arm. You remember that the proximal part, not the distal part with the face and the tongue largely spared. However, weakness of the same degree in both arm and leg can occur, or even hemiparis, the brachial predominance has been described based on the infarction, infarction extending deeply. This is attributable to the infarction of the head of the caudate nucleus, putamen and antidepressant capsule as a result of occlusion the red current artery of humanum. This is from the literature, this is the territory of Hubner, you sometimes will caudate the old infarct, basic dilatation. And this is the acute infarct in the artery Hubner, in the caudate not joining anterior limb of internal. It can sometimes be larger, if large, uh, some, some, some more area of the brain is affected by the Hubner, it can extend into the coronary radiators. There, in such situation, you can have a new infarct in a confined even to the deaf hemiplegia also can occur with Hubner. Okay, any questions in that? And the only point is that sometimes mutism can be mistaken for global FAC. And facial brachial monoplegia can also occur with, with anti-separatory tetra. These are the two clinical points from this case. Uh, sir, how will you differentiate the facial brachial uh, monoplegia of MCA versus ACA clinically? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, if that alone is the manifestation without, without any eye, other hemal function amenity, in MCA tetra involvement, see if you look at the homunculus, 
the lowermost part below the ciliary anterior ciliary fissure comes the mouth tongue and hand then comes the elbow then comes the shoulder by the time shoulder goes to, goes near the supralateral margin so in mc in fact always the hand do cortical by general i'm talking about always the hand will be affected much more than the proximal part of the shoulder whereas in the case of ac in fact producing uh, this thing that pattern will not be there because the representation in the case of in in uh, the, the lamination of fibers in anterior capsule is not with hand mouth like that it is like this that is adjoining the mouth comes the shoulder then the elbow and then the hand so in the facial brachial monoplegia due to ac in fact that is affects on the humor we suppress the anterior capsule the affect should be maximum may be face then shoulder then elbow then least will be hand or less will be hand on the other hand in mca territory the maximum will be face and hand less will be little more less will be elbow then least will be the shoulder so that is the uh, pattern of weakness of uh, there is only way which you can differentiate sometimes it is difficult is my point clear peros i may made it clear to you yes sir yeah because the because the lamination of fibers the arrangement you not know, lamination we can't call arrangement of the fibers in the neural capsule is different from the cortical homunculus the fibers rotate so that the when it reaches the neural capsule the shoulder will come near the face but the cortex near the face it is the thumb and the hand area. Okay, I'll go to another case. A seven-year-old man was found to be found not to get up from bed and not speaking in the morning. He gave his old left hemiplegia about two years back, from which he grew almost totally. He was walking about without any problem, but one day he was found that he is not speaking or anything in the morning. This is the patient on uh, admission. Ashok Kumar. മോളിലോട്ട് നോക്ക് നോക്കിക്കേറ്റ്ലി right what any other possibility brain stem stroke with pseudo barbar pardon proclas brain stem brain stem stroke with pseudo barbar no that because he has no weakness so whatever weakness he had was only old what he, phenomenologically what is having proclas you know he is not no it's not that he is not able to speak he has to be coaxed many times to bring out answer he obeys But every, every action, but every action will be there. You know, popular should be only for the speech. But even the moving the limb or everything has to be coaxed. Even eye movement also, you does not you have to ten three times to bring out an answer. An extreme form of an epithy or epithy or a bully. 
Sivarepadi, Mild Criminal Center of Clover may be part of the old stroke. So what do you want me to do now in this patient? MRI? MRI. This is MRI. Again, bilateral AC occlusion. This is the area of humanoid involvement. This is the other to medial frontal region. See, frontal area, as, as, as somebody has told, thalamic is can also present with acute ebulia, as in artery upper crown involvement, is well, well described. So, this is another situation where you can always think of an anticipable artery involved in, in fact, producing ebulic state. So, this is, uh, at, see, the cortical branches are relatively spared. That is why you did not have any weakness of any lower limbs. Only the deep the branches are affected and the orbital frontal branches are affected. The superficial colossal marginal pericolosal area that arteries are spared. This follow up to two weeks still is got severe apathy, but able to walk about, move about. <laughs> So, persistent abulia can follow bilateral asiatic infarction. And unit lesions can also produce abulia, but it lasts for only a few days. What causes abulia is largely uncertain. The postulated sites of lesion are singlate gyrus, supplementary motor area, and caudate nucleus and duplicated. Now, the other sites causing abulia are thalamic infarct, infarct the frontal lobe, and caudate infarct. In caudate infarction, that may be the only symptom of caudate may be only apathy and abulia. There won't be any motor need. So, yes. will the eye findings differentiate between a Persagon infarct and a anterior yeah. bilateral? That depends upon whether that area is also affected. In artery per crown involvement, that severian artery can supply both middle thalamus, cannot supply the upper brain, upper midbrain, as back as the collicular region. Because the, because the thalamus perpetuating branches also can arise from there. It all depends upon what or in a, in a, what is the relative contribution of the midbrain supply of the artery per crown or directly from the PCA. Sometimes these penetrating eyes are all mainly from the PCA. In that case, the artery per crown may only supply the medial thalamus. Then they can patient can present like a robot like or severe epithy, somnolence can present like that without any kale level. If the thalamic perpetuating artery seems to arise from the artery per crown, you can have eye findings like upward gaze palsy or the upper midbrain syndrome can occur. So it means. No, no, I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. Any other questions? Sir, how do you differentiate the differentiate from severe pseudoverbal pulse? Pseudoverbal pulse. Pseudoverbal pulse. Acute pseudoverbal pulse. In acute pseudoverbal pulse, patient will be mute, cannot speak, and everything. But they will not be apathetic. That patient will try to cooperate with you. We'll have, we'll have an eye contact. They can obey other the movement of the body part. Apathy means in every uh, every body part, movement, every command will be patient will be responding. Patient will respond, but you have to coax, repeatedly ask to bring out an answer. But the other thing, he will be able to cooperate, he will move the lower limb, move the upper limb. Only thing is that he is attempting to speak, but cannot speak. But here the patient does not attempt to speak. He has no drive to speak. Abulia is extreme lack of initiative. But that is not there in cerebral pulse. Initiative is there, but he cannot speak. You go to the weakness. And of course, you can have other findings, like you can look for the 
as a gag reflex, all those things are all can, you know, when uh, the George, all this can, can uh, help you to differentiate emotional encounters, etc. Sir, do you give SSRIs in Apulia? Yes, definitely I give everybody. I can try. I will give that some of them people do respond because ultimately the neurochemical imbalance is in a serotonin deficiency. You can definitely try that. Sir, why is the rail strip then, sir? Pardon? Why is the rail strip? The, is the special, he's not taking anything. Because of the severe abulia, he is not taking anything. He does not want to speak. He does not want to move anything. See, for example, if you know the kinetic mutism is an extreme form of an abulia or apathy, in which the patient will not even try to get up to urinate. He does not want to speak. He does not want to even swallow fluids, swallow food. If fluid is put into his mouth, he may swallow. Telling you the thing, you're making you convinced that I'm mean, making you. Uh, to make sure that his parental muscles are normal. He has no coughing or anything. But he will not take food because he is not interested. It's a total lack of emotional and motor uh, initiative. Not only motor, even emotional initiative is also lacking. One of the complications of AC aneurysm clipping is the kinetic mutism. Some of the patients should go into that state because AC aneurysm, you know, is sometimes anti communicating at aneurysm. In the, in this, the, in the cubular artery is compromised or the penetrating vessels are compromised. Then the medial cingulate or the or the nucleus and cumulus area will be affected. The patient will go into a kinetic mutism. Okay. Shall we go to the other case now? Or if any more questions, you can. Okay. This is a 22-year-old lady. Her complaint started about one and a half months back as severe pricking and burning pain of the tips of the toes. Three days later, she noticed similar pain of the tips of the fingers. The pain is more at night and she could not sleep because of the pain. In fact, she, when he came to my room, she was crying all along because she could not bear the pain on the, on the hands and feet. The pain gets aggravated when the feet touches the floor. No pins and needle paresthesia or any weakness of the hips. So the, no history of any drug intake nor any history of any taking indigenous medications. No step preceding fever. This is the patient, the short examination. Because everything is normal in that patient except. She had got hyperalgesia and the stretcher sensation is normal. Okay. the other way around. Because when I bring the feet down, there she feel more pain. There is less or in this thing. Joint sense vibration was normal. Pere, pere, pere. Sir, if you have a pain, you can't feel the force and sense. But there is no hypnosis over that thing. Whatever they are now. Processes are all normal. Okay. 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 Okay.
and this is how the patient walks because the or the acid patient is walking on a knife it is got severe pain with the the feet that just the floor examination pupils normal reacting to light tone power normal in the upper and lower limb dtr normal in the upper and lower limb sensory system touch pain vibration ap sensation is normal there was decreased temporary sensation over the feet and also the tips of the fingers and hyperalgesia here on the both feet so what do you think the patient is having how do you treat this patient erythromelalgia erythromelalgia sir erythromelalgia but erythromelalgia do you get loss of temperature sensation and things like that alpha level pardon a small fight small fight in the room i i cannot hear you can can somebody tell what you are telling a fractal view of a small fiber yeah yeah right yeah exactly this kind of a small fiber peripheral neuropathy affect the temperature sensation and pain and that can also produce erythema on the feet so what is etiology now what test will you like to do is it the we'll do the conduction study this is a conduction motor conduction normal ff normal sensory potential normal as suspected because in because ncb is going to detect only large fiber functions so what will you do next set to set to set test in fact i did my hospital i can't do that small fiber cbc sir pardon she has no autonomic disturbance per se no postural hypotension and think pupil was normal the other test which you can this is normal you can do us uh what are the electrophysiology test can you do uh, for small fiber yes sir yes sir yes sir yes sir, yes, sir was done which is normal there is a normal study no what other investigation sir, complete bed count sir yeah complete bed count normal anything else you want is it renault like a number of profile pardon renault profile n n n n profile was negative also then will biopsy help sir stimmen biopsy of the small fiber biopsy is can, can do that from the skin biopsy you can do that uh, from the punch biopsy from the look for the small this thing that took a really good technique and the person to interpret should be a good pathologist any evidence for hansen sir no hansen disease it's only acute presentation so other things which can present like a painful neuropathy oh, cryoglobulin uh, hepatitis so, uh, cryoglobulin you got to keep in mind some toxic conditions then uh, you have to keep in mind uh, to look for some pyridoxin Uh, 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 nutritional deficiency, of course, you have to do that. But by that, nutritional deficiency will produce some abnormality in the conduction. It's only not really confined to the small paper. So, a paradoxin toxicity, no? Toxicity. Uh, yeah, paradoxin toxicity produces again ganglion or ganglion pathy that usually produces of the large fibers, the toxic neuropathy. so you always prefer hiv neuropathy can be very painful hcv that is um, hepatitis c they are all negative cryoglobulins were also detected as negative so what to do now she is crying with the pain in the ward we uh, toxic levels sir no doc there's no stiffer injection of toxin to toxin she has not consumed any medication which is very clear about it so i don't think there's a type of person i did not exact in fact i did not do that toxicology screening ssa ssb for jogrens that don't that just done in a profile complete was not the thyroid also can produce thyroid 
thyroid, I don't know, can produce such a pain, painful as well, small pain in neuropathy. But SS, geogrins, of course, can produce a pain in neuropathy. That was done. So this is a patient after treatment. He's very happy you now. The pain is much better. so what treatment i had given bbs steroids steroids yeah right she was initially given pregabalin lacosamide memantine with only very minimal improvement so she was given ivb for five days with a very good improvement and this is one condition which we, do, we seldom see. It's called acute painful neuropathy. It's equivalent to some GBS. It's called acute neuropathic pain. It's a condition that is unrecognized, often difficult to treat, and one that may progress to persistent pain and disability. Causes of painful neuropathies are numerous. However, occasionally patients may suffer from idiopathic painful neuropathy. It's called the common causes are, this is the one our patient was having, acute autonomic and sensory neuropathy. The other is acute chemotherapy induced painful neuropathy and acute nutritional neuropathies. So this particular entity, there's acute autonomic and sensory neuropathy is rare entity causing monophasic, variable, autonomic and sensory disturbance, peak severity during short period of time, usually preceded by an infection. This is primary laxinopathy of unmyelinated and mainly small myelinated fibers. The wide distributed sensory auto symptoms and sensors are that of ganglionopathy affecting both sensory and autonomic ganglia. Some others consider this entity as a variant of GPS, pure sensory type, in the light of similarities concerning the rapid lytic progression preceding infection, arminocytrolical association, response in drivenous I think other painful neuropathies, vasculitic sarcoid, infections, toxic, neuroparaneoplastic, neurolymphomatosis, ultramalalgia, subacute peripheral optino syndrome, and MTS mutation of antimotor sensory neuropathy. So, when a patient comes with acute short duration painful neuropathy, keep this possibility in mind. I have not seen a case before like that. I only uh, tried, just by that, I tried IVMB. So can a Reynolds phenomenon happen like this? Pardon? Reynolds. Reynolds phenomenon is different, no? That is what happened when they were exposed to cold and there's a color changes and occurring. But that is little different from this one. Can it occur in this particular patient? I don't. Possibly, yes. That, that, that is usually episodic. Yeah, episodic only. So sometimes we see postpartum patients and similar complaints. These are the same patients. You know, your, your voice is secondary lot of echo. That's one. Probably something problem that you are sitting in another room or something. A lot of echo is coming. So I can't make out what you are telling. Can you speak to the lower voice? You may be able to get it. So in postpartum patients, sometimes you can see similar complaints uh, presenting with acute uh, painful buzzing sensation with fit with difficulty in walking, like this only. Uh, okay. These are same patients, sir, variant of uh, GB. Right, right maybe, yeah, yeah. Following pregnancy, no? Found delivery. Okay. Maybe I not seen, maybe most like, yeah. So, any questions? Shall we go to another case? Okay. I think I'll go to the last case today. 
all are short kids only. This is a story of a 36 year old female. She is an old case of bilateral retinal detachment with second trauma, resulting in total loss of vision of the right eye and partial loss of vision of the left eye. This happened three years back and it was under treatment from ophthalmologist. In fact, she came to me for some other complaint that. The two and she's whatever vision she has, whatever she sees, she with that vision, necessarily vision equity. The object seems to have a to and fro movement, so called oscillopsy. The movement is moving horizontally and it's very stemming to her. Uh, uh, there is this complaint. So, in short, she has come with oscillopsy for the last three months, but her vision loss has been there for the last three years. This is the video of the patient. Look at the eyeball. Just put this kind of a movement in the eyeball. Patent pushing becomes less. On looking to the right, it becomes less. On looking to the right, it becomes less. So, that's what the same examination is now. So what is he having and what he, what is causing his oscillopsia? here? Pendula nystagmus, sir. It's a, very good. It's a pendula nystagmus. Very good. So what, what this is called acquired pendula nystagmus. Usually pendula nystagmus is present from birth in the congenital, this thing. But here it's acquired. So what is causing an acquired pendula nystagmus? Visual loss. Yeah, visual loss. But what is usual cause? There are three. In fact, visual cause causes. So, we must have seen so many patients with the visual loss. They don't come to you with equipment line stagnants. But uh, one, before that, I will tell you one thing. That when, if you get somebody is complaining of osteopathia and this pendula nystagmus is always acquired, a congenital pendula nystagmus will not produce osteopathia. Okay. So, now, this is the acute pendulum nystagmus. What investigation do you need? What is the commonest side producing is one. This is the ocular parent nystagmus due to the effects of the Gillian Muller triangle. The nystagmus has a part of your parietal micron, as a parietal trunk. Second thing is that acute pendulum nystagmus seen in MS patients. These are the two common ones. So, what do you want now? MRI, sir. MRI was done. There is no brain stimulation here in this patient. This is the flare. Normal. So, what is the cause of acute nystagmus? What are the investigations you want? So I took for the status of the optic nerve function in this patient. Let's see how far, what is the optic nerve. What you see is the optic nerve is atrophied. Thin optic nerve. See the optic nerves are markedly thin bilaterally. See that thin output is bilaterally more on the right side. Here is the optic nerve. Then cycle cut was taken and you find this subnormality. Look at the optic tract here, it's also thinned out. I'll show the static picture. Thinned out optic tract. This is his sequence to find out the optic now, sheath and the, and the, and the CSS surrounding that thing. And again, you can find the optic chasm so is thinned out. And this is the optic now, sheath and the optic now inside. I'll show the static. This is the thinned out optic chasm. And this is the thinned out optic now with a large perineural sheath space, subarachnoid space, the vaginal sheath. 
So this has, as Perez was telling, this is visual deprivation induced acquired pendant nystagmus. Now, acquired pendant nystagmus may affect one or both eyes, can occur in any axis or combination of axis. The common causes are multiple sclerosis, ocular paraphyl tremor due to lesions in the glen muller triangle. This is the two common causes. And idiopathic. Now, what is causing the, why should it develop in patients MS? One of the postulate is that acquired pendulum nystagmus in patient MS arises due to delay in the transmission of visual information due to demyelination of the optic nerve. Delay in the optic conductions could result in abnormal feedback loop regardless of the normal visual acuity and visual sensation. Even the visual, visual is intact, the delay is enough to produce the recalibration problems, producing impaired feedback and then causing the problem with the neural integration. Another proposed mechanism for the pathogenesis is that the oscillations are due to instability of the neural integrator, again due to the defective visual feedback. In visual loss, the ocular drift occurring in patients with visual loss is due to the loss of calibration of the neural integrator. This predicts that loss of vision in one eye will affect the gaze stability of both eyes with the greater instability of the affected eye. For example, a vivid glioma of the optic nerve can also produce a good optic pendulum nystagmus. There are other causes of acute pendulum nystagmus like Hokkien syndrome, Pellier's Melspacket disease, paroxysmal disorders, tolivine abuse is another condition. Alexander's disease, neurosarcoidosis, and vapor disease, and rarely phosphatidine toxicity. So that's this case. Any question? It's only short. No, all are short today. Yeah. Why it is phosphatidine? It will not go. Phenytoin will not. Well, phenytoin will do anything probably. Then uh, people are using phosphatidine now. That's why this has come. So this is from literature only. I've got this, uh, this uh, causes. In the last time, uh, treatment, sir. Treatment to subside that uh, penla nystagmus. You know, in fact, yeah, I tried to I put the patient on uh, GABA pendin and uh, Leofen. I don't know whether it'll work it out or not. The one which you usually try for other causes. When you have so many times, it will not work. Periodic alkaline nystagmus, it will work. And some other nystagmus also, uh, don't be nystagmus, some, some of these drugs will work. But what to do here to help the patient some more or other? So how to differentiate it from congenital implant studies? The one, the one is... Uh, it, it, it exactly mimics congenital horizontal acquired pendulum nystagmus. Only thing is that it, it, this will, uh, congenital nystagmus will not produce any oscillopsia. And usually they have a null point also. And, and one position, congenital nystagmus has got certain peculiar characteristics. One, this pendular and the direction of beating is always the same wherever you look. Suppose even if it is horizontal, looks up also, the beats horizontally. That's one point favoring congenital nystagmus. Second point is that at one position of the globe in the orbit, the nystagmus will be least, and that is the way that and, and the patient adopts a head position to bring the eye into the null position so that the visual equity is best. So the head position or head torticol is, is to make the eye come into the null position so that the least involuntary movement occurs and best visual equity occurs. The other point is that congenital nystagmus will get attenuated or decrease on convergence. We are more on looking at far objects. And the most important clue, which is pathognomonic of congenital nystagmus, is the inverted OKN. That is seen only in congenital nystagmus. So, in your OKN or optocandial nystagmus, when you move the tape onto the right side, either the slow, slow compound is to the right and fast compound to the opposite side, as you all know. But in the case of congenital nystagmus, it is the other way around. It's called perverted okay. When you move the tape to the right side slowly, or move to the right side, you get fast compound to the right, not the slow compound. That's, a, a, that's seen only in congenital nystagmus. 
So these are the things by which you can differentiate and release that as a one point. Is it C1 nystagmus is same of pendular nystagmus? Yeah, C1 is perfectly right. The C1 nystagmus is a type of a pendular nystagmus. You know, there are two types of C1 nystagmus. The classical one which you are referring to is a pendular nystagmus, where the eyes goes up and in dot and comes back. So you're equal with equal velocity. See, in case of pendular nystagmus, there's no fast component, only slow component. So the one which goes up in in dot and comes down in x dot are in the same velocity. That's a typical season nystagmus which is seen in lesions of the cellular lesions. So what do we do to the again defective visual feedback or to the neural intermeter? On the other hand, there's other type of season nystagmus, what is called as the jerk season nystagmus, or is called a hemi season nystagmus. In hemi season nystagmus, it's actually a jerk type of nystagmus. That is a fast component and a slow component. Here, what, how, what happens is that when the eye makes a movement upward and in dot, that will be fast movement. Then the other will be slow movement. There's a slow component, the other component is a fast one. So that is called the hemi season nystagmus or a jerk hemi nystagmus. A jerk type of season nystagmus that is seen in lesions of interstitial nucleus of the heart in the midbrain. Right. Any, any any more questions? Okay, I think I exhausted my case today. This is not a good case. I'll... So shall we close? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anger tough months like a anger tough or to remember for fine details. Uh -huh. Sir, I have one doubt, sir. Yeah, please, please. Sir, uh, uh, some of these uh, pendular nystagmus, yeah. uh, we can see jerky component also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, you're, uh, per you're, you're perfectly right. In congenital nystagmus is purely, hardly ever it is purely pendula. They have got pendula nystagmus in the primary position. When you take the eyes to the eccentric position, it becomes a similar jerky quality. It becomes a classical, uh, our um, uh, jerky type of nystagmus. It's fast component, slow component. That is well known. That's a typical, that is usually the one which you see in congenital nystagmus. But not the one with acquired pendula nystagmus. It is always pendula. Okay, in congenital, do, do they present with symptoms? Usually, do they? Okay. No, they present with decreased visual acuity. They have a problem in reading. Usual problem by the complaint is that the mother or the parent will bring the child to you, telling the child has no complaint because it is present from birth onwards. How can he complain? So, when the, he's, whenever he is looking at the paper or the TV, who could just book, he keeps his head in awkward position. He keeps his head tilted and then read and look at the TV. Then the parents get scold the child, why are you keeping your head like that, tilted like that, and he'll get beaten up for this thing. Then they realize that he is, he is only he can see and lie like that. Then bring the question to you. You ask him what is his problem? He has no problem. Because he is adapting, he's making his head tilted so that. The eyes are in the, in the, brought in the position of the orbit in such a position that the, the movements are least. He adapts it. He, he, ad he has adapted to that position. So yes. that's a comment. That sir, is why. Okay. Yeah, please. Sir, in APN, uh, we don't uh, see convergence, uh, convergence like um, uh, nystagma subsiding with convergence and null point. Or is it? Uh, similar to congenital uh, pendular nystagmus. In 18 means? You in acute know. pendular nystagmus. Okay, I, I, IPN, okay. Usually they don't have a null point, except that in, in, in this particular, this is the thing, a point I wanted to mention. She was having nystagmus more in one particular direction. 
So that is probably because I don't know why that is occurring. That is usually seen in congenital nystagmus. And convergence also will not uh, yeah, convergence produce the pendular nystagmus. Right. In nystagmus. accurate pendula. Yeah. Okay. It is a congenital nystagmus. That is in this patient will try to keep the things very closely and read. Because they will look at a distant, um, they, so they can, you can also prescribe glasses to produce mild convergence so that the patient will be more comfortable. Again, prescribe glasses and the conventional glasses so that will make it more comfortable. Thank you, sir. Okay. Is there any reason for uh, the explanation for this null point? I don't, I don't know. I don't know the explanation. Okay. So. Other condition where you can null point is the acquired pain, this thing, uh, periodic alternate nystagmus. In periodic alternate nystagmus, also in one point, that nystagmus will be least. But on the other point, it will be much more. And that's one point differentiating from uh, congenital, uh, sorry, congenital periodic alternate. Periodic or is also classically due to lesion of the nodulus. But there are other sites in the cerebellum and also can produce. But there is a one condition called congenital uh, I mean, um, periodic artery nystagmus. In congenital periodic artery nystagmus, you can have a wandering null point. The null point may vary from place to place. Whereas the quiet type, it may be fixed. The wandering null point is the point favoring a congenital type of uh, periodic coordinating disturbance. So, uh, like, can, uh, can you show the congenital pendular nystagmus next class to differentiate between infantile nystagmus syndrome? Okay, I can show Abnormal it. fusion. Next class. Oh, yes, okay. you can show it even now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, just uh, I could find you. I'll just hold you, just hold on. I'll okay. present this to you. Probably, maybe, I'm not doing that thing. But I think I have to share the screen once again in that case. Okay, I'll, I'll close it and then uh, I'll show you just now.
Is my screen seen? Yes. Yeah, I will show that two, three list I will show that. This is the Kanjari list I will show that. But I, I, I cannot show the classical null point. There is one another video which I couldn't get. It. I think I will bring it next time. This is one Kanjari list I will show that. And uh, I will also show the this thing, Caesar uh, list I will show in the classical. Uh, this is see, this is a classical pendular type of Caesar list I will show. When going up and in, see equal velocity on both sides. It is not the classical. Uh, the other one, it will be half jerk, half will be pendular. It is a classical pendular distance. But another good tangent distance showing the null point, which is, I don't know where it is in my folder. Okay, I will bring it next class. Okay, any questions? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night.